passage that we're going to be in this morning is Revelation, Revelation of John. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. As we consider the reality that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it's appropriate for us to likewise consider why this is so important for us. You see, ever since the fall of Adam, there has been for the human race a looming, inescapable burden placed upon all of us. There stands for every person everywhere throughout all of human history a time when you will die, a time when you will go away from this earth. There has been an appointed time for birth, an appointed span of your life, and an appointed time to leave this earth. This has been set by God from the very beginning. All of our days, they are numbered. This is a result of the cursed curse in the very beginning. Adam sinned. He transgressed the Lord's righteous standard. And in this sin, he plunged the entire race into sin. Not only that, but the whole world was cursed by this choice. We feel the effects of the curse all around us. We see them every day. We see them in the world. We see them in the events that are taking place. We see them in our own lives. When we catch a cold, when we come down with some sort of illness, for those who are getting older, when you look in the mirror and you see new lines on your face, the effect of the curse, some of you young folks will see that soon. We understand that we are weak and frail vessels because of what sin has done to us. Our physical bodies are limited. They are finite. They are fading away. And so even within ourselves, there is this ever-present reminder of death. Most people spend their lives trying to avoid this, this thought of death, trying to put it away from them, attempting to ignore the evidences of age and grasping at ways to prolong their lives here on this earth, ignoring the reality But sometimes we're faced with the sobering truth of our own morality in such a way that we cannot look away from it. And the natural reaction to this is fear. It's fear. Especially if we're considering this according to the way that the Lord defines our own sinful condition in His Word. If we understand our condition before God, then we understand that as we march towards death, we are marching towards judgment. We will be measured by a righteous standard. We will be held accountable for everything that we've thought, desired, and done in our lives. We will stand before a holy and righteous God. That is a heavy weight. Thankfully, Christ has supplied the solution for this problem, the greatest problem that we face. And Christ has supplied the comfort for us in this life, no matter what we face. The answer to our faith, to this fate of physical death and spiritual death, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Christ from the dead is our comfort. It is our hope. This is what we lean on. This miraculous work of God stands for us as the proof that we too will be raised again. If we are entrusting ourselves to Him, if we believe that He is who He said He is and He has done what He said He has done, then our hope is in the risen Christ. And this is the comfort of Christ's resurrection power that he offers to John in our passage this morning. And so the title of the message this morning is 
the consoling power of the resurrected Lord. The consoling power of the resurrected Lord. As we work through this passage, this is Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. We're going to see four recognitions of Christ that inform our hope of eternal resurrection. Four recognitions of Christ that inform our hope of eternal resurrection. I'll give those to you now. The first is the fear of Christ. The fear of Christ. The second, the assurance of Christ. The assurance of Christ. The third, the identity of Christ. The identity of Christ. And the fourth, the accomplishment. Accomplishment of Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. If you have that, I'll begin reading verse 17. It says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, where would we be without this truth? Where would we be if you had left us in our sinful state, in our desperate state, without hope? Thank you, Lord, for your condescension. Thank you for coming to this earth. Thank you for taking on human flesh. Thank you for dying for us. You have paid the penalty of death for all those who believe. Lord, we praise you for that. But not only that, you conquered death. And you rose again. And now you are the living one, proving to us that we too may have resurrection life. Lord, thank you for this hope. Help us to comprehend it this morning. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. So as we look at these two verses, this first recognition of Christ that we see in John himself, the fear of Christ, this is something that we must necessarily have. All those who come to know him must understand the fear of Christ. And in this passage, the Apostle John, as he calls himself, the Apostle whom Jesus loved is confronted here with the glory of the risen Christ. You remember, he had walked with Jesus on earth. He had followed Jesus. He had been with him. He had leaned against him at the table. He had been close to his Lord. He had witnessed his miracles. He had seen his power. He had even seen a glimpse of his glory there on earth. But now, now in this moment... John sees his Lord and Savior as he is in all of his glory. In this vision, John experiences God. He sees Jesus Christ for who he is. Throughout church history, there have been many testimonies from all sorts of different people who have claimed to see Jesus Christ in a similar way. They claim to have been visited by Christ. They claim to have gone to heaven and seen Christ. But so many of them fall short of what we see in Scripture. I want to give you a few examples of this. In the 1200s, a Roman Catholic woman claimed that Christ came to her in a vision, offering her whatever gift of grace she should desire. When he did, she asked for a better grasp of Latin, that she may understand the Word of God and sing His praise. Christ granted her request, and her experience was she was able to worship in a more heightened state. And then Christ came to her a second time, and she asked that she may exchange this gift for another gift. And when he asked, supposedly, what the next gift should be, she then asked that Christ would give her his own heart. And then she then proclaimed that Christ reached into her and removed her heart and replaced it with his own at the same time hiding her heart within his chest. Blasphemous. Blasphemous. 
Another account states that in the 1600s, a woman named Marguerite Alacoque recounted a series of visions of Christ coming and speaking to her. And in December 1673, she reported that Jesus permitted her to rest her head upon his heart, and then he disclosed to her all the wonders of his love. It's a little bit different than what we see here. In 1859, a man named John Vianney, known as a great exorcist, claimed to be blessed with countless visions of Jesus, Mary, and demons. He also prophesied the coming final triumph of Mary. I can assure you he may have seen something, but it was not the risen Christ. In 1844, a woman named Ellen White said that while kneeling at a prayer meeting in Maine, she experienced a vision of Jesus Christ. She said that she felt the power of God come upon her, and when she saw Jesus, she said there was no mistaking that beautiful countenance. That expression of benevolence and majesty could belong to no other but Jesus. And Ellen White would go on to see many visions, supposedly, from which she would write the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. I want to give you just one more. In 1820, a young man by the name of Joseph Smith, Jr. reported that God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him in a vision in the woods near his home in rural New York. At the moment the light appeared, Joseph claimed that he felt delivered from the enemy and that, that it held him bound, and Joseph felt great joy and love. And during the vision, Joseph asked which church was correct, and Jesus supposedly answered, telling Joseph not to join any of the churches, that he's going to give him the correct doctrine about what the church should believe. There are countless other claims by all manner of people to have seen Jesus Christ in his glory. We even have modern claims of children going to heaven, claiming to have seen God, claiming to have seen Jesus. We have modern claims of Jesus speaking to people in various ways. Many of these are obviously ludicrous oftentimes bringing with them some sort of heretical doctrine, as many of these that I read to you have. And at times they're totally blasphemous in nature. If you notice, in these that I just read, there's a key missing ingredient in all of them. Something is missing here. When we compare it to how the writers of Scripture detail visions of God, there is a marked difference. Now I want to read you exactly what the Apostle John sees in the pages of inspired Scripture when he experiences the risen Christ glorified. Look just a few verses back, Revelation 1, 10 through 16. This is what John sees. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write in a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And his head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And having in his right hand seven stars and a sharp two-edged sword which comes out of his mouth. And his face was like the sun shining in its power. John has seen the risen Christ. The lion of Judah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is who he has seen. John will see Christ again in chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, and this is what he recounts there. He says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sits on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, having a name written on him, which is no one knows except himself. And being clothed with a white garment dipped in blood. That is the blood of his enemies. 
His name is also called the Word of God, and the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with the rod of iron, and he treads the winepress wine press of the wrath of the rage of God, the Almighty. And he has on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the risen and glorified Christ. This is how he is portrayed. Now, the proper response to this God, this Righteous judge, the one who has the power to kill the nations with the sword of his mouth. If you were to see this Christ glorified today, I can assure you you would not run up and give him a hug. You would not lay down on his shoulder. You would not call him your homeboy. You would not be flippant about this occasion. No, if you saw Christ glorified today you would respond just as John did. And how is it that he responds? Back to chapter 1, verse 17. He says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. This is how you would respond when you see God in all his glory. This is how you would respond when you see the risen Christ. Remember, this is the exact same Jesus who John had reclined against at the table. When Jesus was veiled in human flesh, when he was there on earth looking just like the rest of us, John was near to him. But when John sees him in his glory, he falls at his feet as though he is one dead. This is the same reaction Isaiah has in Isaiah 6-5 when he sees his vision of the Lord. He says in that passage, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we understand who God is, when we recognize Him, when we see Him in His glory, you know what it does for us? It helps us know ourselves far better. Because when we see Him in His glory, we understand just how sinful and weak and mortal we are. We become fearful. We give Him reverent worship. Because we understand we are undeserving. And if this God chooses, with this sword that comes from his mouth, he can smite us on the spot, and he would be right to do so. This is what it means to experience God. See, the truth is, all of us have gone astray. All of us are wicked. All of us have transgressed his standard. There is none of us who have lived good enough that we can stand before this God. There is none of us who can point back to our lifestyle and say, Look, Lord, at what I've done. All of us, when we stand before Him, our righteousness is as filthy rags. We bring nothing to Him. We offer nothing in payment for our life. And if we are judged righteously, we will spend eternity in hell. We are under the curse. We are those who will die. And unless something happens, we will experience a spiritual death that leads us into all eternity. This is what it means to stand before the righteous judge, the God of the world, the God of the universe, Jesus Christ. And this is exactly who he is. He is the one true God. But 
it's vital that each of us realize that knowing God, understanding God, having a glimpse of who God is, it while it helps us properly understand ourselves and our own sinfulness, it also opens up to us the power of God to save. All praise be to God because when we do recognize the depravity of our condition, when we fall on our knees before Him in desperation, recognizing that we need mercy from Him, we find mercy freely waiting for us. See, the response John receives from his master when he falls on his knees before him as a dead man, well, it's not judgment, it's not condemnation, it's not what John deserves. It's not a word of justice. See, he could send John to hell for all eternity, but John is a believer. You see, rather, it is a word of comfort and love. This is the point of this passage. This is the reason why Jesus says the things that he says right now. It is to console John, to comfort him, to tell him, do not be afraid. This next recognition of Christ, we must recognize that He is a merciful God. This is the assurance of Christ. The assurance of Christ. As John prostrates himself before the Lord, as he falls down before Him as a dead man, Jesus comes to him, He places His right hand upon him, and He says to John, Do not be afraid. Do not be casts away fear. He portrays mercy to John. He tells him, don't be overtaken. This is the same thing that Jesus would say to us who believe. This is the same message for all of us. Do not be afraid. Do not fear death. Do not fear the effects of the curse. Do not fear the things that we see happening around us that are the result of the fall. Do not fear this ultimate fate that is physical death because there is something after. We will meet this merciful God, this gracious God, this loving God. And it is through His power that He casts away all fear it's an, interesting, it's an interesting thing that this God of the universe, He is, for sinners, the most terrifying thing that we could ever face. But this same God is likewise the most gracious and loving being that we can ever encounter as well. Two paradigms. Two paradigms of God. For those who are in their sins, fear. For those who are in Christ, no fear. See, Christ is the one who brings condemnation, but Christ is also the one who we run to for rescue. The very one who would hold us accountable for our sin is the one that we must cling to for salvation. And to those who trust in Him, He proclaims, do not be afraid. As 1 Corinthians 15, 55-57 says, O death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ, being the God that He is, He is our rescue, and He is our assurance, and He is our comforter. It is in Christ that we place our hope. And so for the purpose of comforting John this morning while... John is overcome with reverence and fear before him. Christ places his hand upon him. He, he commands the fear to leave John. And John now can do the work that he's about to call him to. He's about to commission John to do something for him, to take this message to the earth. Now, I want us to notice something here, a point of personal application. As we talked about, we are all sinners. We are all condemned. We all stand before a holy God. All of us, if we go and stand before the Lord without trusting in Him, 
the fate of eternal death stands for us. And so the very first step for each and every person, each and every human being, if you are to be ushered into the resurrection power of God, this is what must happen. You must come to an understanding of who God is and who you are. You must comprehend it. Now, you won't understand it to the degree that John has, not until you go and see him. But you must understand it factually. You must comprehend it within your heart. Our God is a holy God. He is a righteous God. He is the judge of all things. He is sovereign over all things. He is the one who is in control, and He is the one who will hold each person accountable, and we all, everyone, will stand before Him one day. You see, you will stand before God. No matter what you believe, no matter what your religion is, no matter what you think about this world philosophically, no matter what you believe about the different systems of the world that people have come up with to try to explain away things, every single person born from the beginning to the end will stand before this God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. You will stand before Him. And so, we must now, before we stand before Him, come to the recognition that we are utterly desperate before Him. That we need His mercy. That we cannot be saved apart from the finished work that He has completed. And unless we bow ourselves in submission to Him, unless we prostrate ourselves before Him, unless we come to Him as the publican, who would not look up to heaven but beat on his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Unless this is our heart condition, we will not be saved. We will not know him. We will not experience resurrection. And so we must come before him as one who understands that we need the mercy of God. Lord, give us mercy. We trust in you. All people everywhere are called to come to Christ, to submit themselves to Him. You, this morning, all of you, you are under the curse, but yet you are called to come to Christ. Come to Christ today. If you have not come to Him, come to Him today. Bow yourself before Him. Recognize your sinful state. Recognize that you will stand ultimately before Him one day and prepare your heart for that time. And if you come to Christ, you will find a merciful Savior. You will find one who is ready and willing to accept all those who trust in Him by faith. And in this, you can find comfort in His statement this morning. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. If you've come to Christ, there is no fear in death. In fact, death is simply moving towards what we were created for. It is to glorify God for all eternity. So come to Him this morning. Now we can have assurance. We can have hope. Not simply because Christ commands us to not be afraid, but because of who He is and what He has done. And so, this third recognition is the identity of Christ. The identity of Christ. This is what He tells John. And as we said, the reason why He tells John His identity, the reason why He shows John who He is, is for the purpose of comforting Him. How is it that Jesus comforts John in his fear? It is by confirming for him exactly who he is, reminding him that he is God. Look at what he says next. He says, Do not be afraid, 
for I am the first and the last and the living one. Now look at that first, very first part of that statement there. I am. I am. It's not a coincidence that he uses this term, ego, I, me, in the Greek, I am, because this is a self-identification. He is identifying himself as the great I am. I am is speaking to John this morning. Now we remember this statement. John has focused in on this statement throughout his gospel, but particularly in John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59. We have in that passage Jesus having a very confrontational dialogue with the Jewish leaders. And in this dialogue, they accuse him of having a demon. And after they ask him, how could he have seen Abraham? Abraham, who lived 2,000 years before, round about. Jesus answers them this way, John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What did they do in verse 59? They picked up stones to stone him. You think that's because they just got really mad? They were always angry at Jesus. They were always looking for a reason, looking for a way. If they could have stoned him at any point and gotten away with it, they would have. But right here, this is the point. They make the decision. Now is the time. We can do this, and it will be right. We can get away with it. That's because in this statement, when Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am, this is a statement of divinity. Jesus is claiming here to be God. He is claiming to be the great I Am. He is looking back into the past at when Abraham was born. And he is saying, before that, ego I me, I am, presently, existing, I am above all things, I have created all things, I am not bound by anything, this is who I am. So they pick up stones to stone him, realizing that he just claimed to be God. This is who Jesus claims to be in Revelation as well. This goes all the way back to Exodus 3, verse 13. When Moses asked God, what shall I tell the people? When he was going to lead them out of the promised land, and and they ask who it is that sent you, what God sent you to us? This is, what John, this is what God says to Moses. You tell them, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is who Jesus is. This is who Jesus claims to be. This is a consistent theme. It's a consistent theme throughout John. It's a consistent theme throughout his writings. It's a consistent theme throughout Scripture. Jesus Christ is not a created being. Jesus Christ did not just become one day. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. He has always existed. He always will exist. He is the great I Am. He's the God of the Old Testament. He's the God of the New Testament. There are no other gods besides Him. When he says to John here, do not be afraid, I am, he also adds this to it. I am the first and the last. I'm the first and the last. Now, in this phrase, the first and the last, we should think of this in a sequential way. In other words, Jesus is all-encompassing. There is no one before him and there is no one after him in sequence. And this is exactly who God has set himself apart to be. Turn to Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41 through chapter 48, 
the God of Israel is setting himself apart from all of the false gods of the earth, all of the false manifestations of religion, all of the different pagan deities that people come up with, all of the idols that people worship. And in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4, God says, Who has worked and done it, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, Yahweh, am the first and with the last. I am He. A few chapters ahead in Isaiah 44, verses 6 and 7. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And there is no God besides me who is like me. Let him call out and declare it. The God of Israel is, is here setting himself apart, setting himself against the gods of the earth, even taunting the idols of the earth, taunting the false religions of the world, saying, who can declare the beginning from the end? Come forth. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 12 through 13 He says, Hear me, O Jacob, even Israel whom I called, I am he. I am the first, I am also the last. Also, my hand founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. And when I call to them, they stand together. In these statements, we see God's declaration of His absolute sovereignty. His sovereignty over all things. Nothing has come before Him. Nothing comes after Him. He is the first and the last. He has determined the events of time from the very beginning. Everything that will transpire in all of human history, God has set it in motion. He is active within it, and it occurs exactly as He desires, including the salvation of men's souls. He is in control of all things. This is who Christ is declares to John that he is in Revelation 1. I am the first and the last. Same God. Sovereign over all. Take comfort in this, John. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on. Back in Revelation 1. He says, I am the first and the last. And the living one. The living one. So not only is he the great I am, not only is he the first and the last above all things, but also he assures John that he is living the living one. He is the living God. And this is in stark contrast to all other false gods of the earth. This is in stark contrast to all of the powerless religions of the earth. None of them are interactive with humanity. None of them have power over creation. None of them have the ability to save. He is the living God who breaks through into human history, interacts with man transforming things, shaping men's hearts, dealing with us here. He is the living God. Psalm 1846 declares, The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Aren't you thankful that we serve a living God? When we pray to Him, He hears us. When we seek salvation in Him, He is able to save. When we see the events of the world happening that seem out of control, we know His hand is at work in all of it. We find comfort in the reality that we serve the living God. We don't serve idols made by hands, things fashioned out of wood and gold, False gods devised by men's minds, put together by 
the imagination of foolish people. Back in Isaiah chapters 41 through 48, it talks about that, how a man will cut down a tree, and then with part of the tree, he carves out an idol to worship. And with the other part of the tree, he casts the wood into the fire to warm himself. The foolishness of idolatry. And yet, this is what all human beings do. From birth, we are idol worshipers. We, if, even if we don't worship some sort of formed image, we worship a God that we define in our own minds. Ultimately, this God is self. We are all idolatrous by nature. But the things that we worship have no power to save because these things are all dead, just like us. But we serve a living God. A God who is able to save. A God who is not like the idols of this earth. A God who is not like the God from those different encounters that I read to you at the beginning. These people who supposedly encountered Jesus. No, he's not like any of that. He's a God who works and acts according to his will and has the power to save us. That's why it's so reassuring to us to know who it is that we serve. This this greatest enemy that we have, this enemy of death, this thing that we cannot escape, this, this thing that has our name and is coming for us, Jesus Christ went and warred against it because He is all-powerful, He is all-sovereign, He is the living God, and He is able to conquer it. And in this, we find the fourth recognition the accomplishment of Christ. We've seen His person. Now we see what He has done. The accomplishment of Christ. Notice what He says. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. What did Jesus Christ do for us? Well, the God of the universe This sovereign God, this living God, the all-powerful one, he condescended himself. He took on human flesh. He came to this earth, and he lived as a man. He lived a life that we could never live, a perfect life according to God's righteous standard. He did not deserve any punishment. He did not deserve any death. And yet, having lived this perfect life, he then willfully submitted himself to the wrath of God for us. He bore God's wrath in his body on the cross. He stood between us and what we deserve. And he paid the penalty of death for all those who believe. He is our substitutionary atonement. He bore it for us. He suffered for us. He drank the wrath of the cup of God. The Lord of the universe died for sinful, idolatrous human beings. He says, I became living one became dead. Now that is not that he became dead in his divinity, but rather in his humanity. He died. He paid for it as a human substitute. This in no way changed the essence of his divine nature. You see, he still remained the living God. Nothing about that changed, and so For that reason, not even death could hold him down. And he broke the chains of death. And he conquered it. And he now lives on. Because he is the living one. He says to John, Behold, look and see the resurrection power of God. The power of God to break the chains of death. I have paid the penalty and I have conquered the penalty and now I am alive forevermore. 
And when he says, Behold, I am alive, this is a statement that it, it should immediately cast away every fear of the consequences of death because we know that there is one who can conquer our greatest enemy. There is one who stands above death. And it is the one who is alive. The perpetually living one. The one who is the resurrected one. Jesus Christ lives. And so as we read before, for us there is no longer any sting in death. There is no longer hopelessness according to our fate. Jesus is the proof. He's the proof that death can be conquered. And He's done this for us. He's conquered it for us who believe. All those who come before Him, all those who fear Him, all those who recognize that they are incapable of saving themselves. Prostrate yourself before this living God he has conquered death for you. And because He has conquered death, because He has warred against death and overcome it, now He says, I hold the keys of death and of Hades. You see, Jesus Christ holds the keys to where we spend eternity. He's in control of it. He is sovereign over it. And for all those who trust in Him, who entrust themselves to Him, He holds the key that unlocks the door to eternal life. And though we may die physically, like Him, because of what He has done, we grasp to the promise of that we will be resurrected by Him. He conquered death for us. He stood in our place. He bore the wrath of God that was meant for us. He suffered the fate that we deserve. He became dead. But He is living. He is alive. And it's all about Him. It's all about Him. He is all power. We are not. He is sovereign. We aren't. He is eternal. He is set apart from everything and everyone. He is holy. And it is He who crushed death under His feet. And so it is He who has all power to grant eternal life to all those who believe in Him. All those who follow Him as Lord through faith. Our Lord. Our Christ, Jesus, the living one. And this is why Jesus says to John, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. John has fallen before him as a dead man. But Jesus places his hand upon him. And he says, Do not be afraid, John. John knows who Jesus Christ is. John knows who he is in person. John knows the work that he has accomplished. And so all Christ has to do in this encounter is remind him of the truth that he already knows. John, don't be afraid. I hold the keys to death and Hades. The one that you know. The one that loves you. Therefore, John has eternal life. Praise be to God that this merciful, long-suffering God of love is the same one who holds the power to eternal life. And He extends the call to all people everywhere to come to Him, turn from your sin, follow Him as Lord. Believe that this one true God is the only way of salvation. There is no other way to overcome death. It is only through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He calls you. Come to Him. He does not require that you live according to some sort of law. 
to come to Him. He does not require that you clean things up to come to Him. He is looking for worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. He calls you, come to Him, recognizing your desperate need for a Savior. Turn from your sin through faith and trust yourself to Him, knowing that He's completed the work. And rest in Him. And in this, there is an answer to the ever-present reality of the curse. That is to follow the one who has overcome the curse. For all those who believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection power of God, these words from John at the end of Revelation grant us all hope. In Revelation 21, verses 3 through 7, we find our hope in this. John says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, They are done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God. He will be my son. This is what the resurrection is all about. It is God saving a people for himself who will be raised again into eternal life to live forever, serving, worshiping, glorifying the one true God. Jesus secured for us the means by which We have this fellowship. This world is dying. It's fading away. But there is an eternal kingdom that we are moving towards if we have entrusted ourselves to Him. So this morning, do you believe that Jesus Christ is who He said He is? And that He has done what He claims to have done? believe it? Do you believe that He is the only way to salvation? Do you believe that He is the one and only God? Do you understand that when judged by God according to your own deeds, you will be found lacking? Do you understand? Do you know that unless you believe, you will most certainly die eternal spiritual death. But do you also know Jesus this morning? The one who died for our sins. Do you know him? If you find that you don't, come to him today. Follow him as Lord. Entrust yourself to the work that he has completed on the behalf of sinners. And if you do this from a changed heart, you too will receive eternal life through the resurrection of the dead. And for you, there is no fear in death. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you are the solution chief solution to our problem. Thank you. Thank you for providing for us the opportunity to live again. I pray, Lord, that everyone in this room today would come to this knowledge, would understand the saving grace of God, 
But Lord, first, please, if there be anyone here today who does not understand your grace, bring them to a comprehension of their depravity. Let them understand their sinful state. Place it in front of them in such a way that they cannot look away from it. Remind them of the truth, the fate that awaits for all of us, and that is death. It is coming. We are under the curse. We cannot escape the fact that we will leave this physical world. And there is only one solution. Lord, please, if there be anyone who does not know that this morning, let this be the day of salvation for them. Lord, for all of us who do know you, let this be a day of joy and of praise for what you have done for us. Because for us, there is no fear. There is no fear in death. Death is a transformation for us into eternal things. We praise you for that this morning. It's in your name that I pray.